The road journey from Bengaluru to Kodagu crosses southern Karnataka with all the vibrancy, noise and colour of our tropical country. First, the busy Bengaluru Mysuru Highway. Then on to Hunsur. Through part of the Nagarohole National Park to the coffee and tea estates of Kodagu. The small district of Kodagu is the birthplace of the river Kaveri. It borders Kerala and is at the southern end of the magnificent Western Ghats, a biodiversity hotspot. But deforestation has hit Kodagu, and wildlife and the wealth of the forest are disappearing. Our journey is to a place where the treasure of the natural forest is being protected. A sanctuary, a privately owned forest that is being given back to nature. This is a forest that was allowed to regenerate. In South Kodagu, at the end of a long and bumpy road, is the Save Animals Initiative Sanctuary. It's a 300-acre dream. The dream of Pamela and Anil Malhotra, who made a long journey through life and geographically as well, to come here to try and save at least this portion of Kodagu's precious forest. Hello. Hi, Maya. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to, nice meet, to you meet you too. Too. What a beautiful place. You haven't seen anything yet. What, what are these flowers? These are wild flowers mm. which we transplanted from the jungle on our land around our house because they're so unique. I have never seen them in any nursery. I, I, have, I haven't seen anything like yeah. this either. And they're shaped like a crown. So we've named them crown, crown flowers. flowers. <laughs> okay. And the butterflies have confirmed they are what should be here because they come and really suck up the nectar from all these. after so many phone exactly calls. Exactly, after we, we've been talking about coming here for a long time. Again. Yes. And it's a magic world. Thank you. As you enter the gates, it's like you're in a different space altogether. No, this is an absolutely fantastic view. Yes, Ooh. it is. What, what is that? Which, which range is that? That is the Brahmagiri uh, okay. range, mm -hmm. and that is the Brahmagiri Wildlife Sanctuary. Okay. So our sanctuary borders the Brahmagiri Wildlife okay. Sanctuary and adds 1.2 square kilometers extra buffer zone of forest. The wildlife can come here and be undisturbed. They're safe. They're Even safe. Even if they're out of the park yes. area, They're safe. they are safe here. In fact, they've, we've actually seen our sanctuary turn into a crash, where the wildlife are coming to give birth. We've had, over the last six to eight years, four elephant Elephants born yes. here, two boys, two girls. We have leopard cats who are uh, breeding here, yes. which are very rare. We have all kinds of birds, and we have uh, somber, cheetah, all kinds of things that are actually coming here to give birth. A safe place. A safe, safe, a safe place. nursery. Exactly. A safe. a safe nursery that they don't have to worry about anybody disturbing them. So a sanctuary and a safe maternity suite for the wildlife. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Safe maternity suite, that's a, a wonderful way of putting it. <laughs> we had some good rain last night, so I wanted to take you in the okay, back and show you. Yes, sure. Yes. Our second name is Butterfly Haven, because of all the butterflies that are here. Wild otters are disappearing from Kodagu, but this is one place where they have a safe home. They're being killed off, some by fishermen, some by nets. Their habitats are being destroyed because when they nest, they need large trees with sandy root systems to dig inside. Yes, yes. Those large trees are being all cut down, and so they have no place to reproduce. And even sand mining is taking away the Yes, in which absolutely. Are. Sand mining is disastrous mm -hmm. for everything. And this year, we have been really, really really thrilled because in the past the maximum number we have ever seen here and I'm going back over 10 to 15 years ago 
was just four, four. mom and four. dad and two pups. We have a family group of different ages that number at least nine or ten. I could not believe it, and they've been here right all here. morning, right in here backyard. in my backyard. <laughs> and day before yesterday, I got a great video uh, of one of them just paddling around, enjoying itself, having the joy of life. It wasn't hunting. It was just playing, going under the water and throwing out the water and breathing out and shaking its head and doing it again and again and just paddling around the joy of life. It is a true privilege to be able to protect the forest, protect this habitat, and protect the wildlife that depends on it. We depend on it too. Living as they do in the forest, the couple have ways of interacting with the wild animals with whom they share their home. The first thing is to overcome your fear because you're going to be denying yourself incredible experiences yes. if you can't overcome your fear. Okay. The second thing is to show respect. Yes. You may not be afraid of the animals, but if you don't show respect for their space, for their family unit, for their place in nature, for their skills and talents, and their strength, the and their people, strength yes. then you could be in a lot of trouble. And the third thing is to give love. love. They may not understand our verbal sounds, right, Sean? But they love. do Giving understand love. love. Hello? Here's Shanti. Hello, this? this is Shanti. Hello, Shanti. Pamela and Ani came from different backgrounds, different cultures, and even, initially, different political beliefs. They've been married now for more than 40 years, and this, saving the forest, is their common dream. Anil was born in India and made his way westwards. The Beatles had just come on the scene then, and so being idealistic, mm. I wanted to change the system where Truth prevails, love prevails, and hypocrisy is gotten rid of. Of course, it was too idealistic for all that, but you know us. A real 1960s yes, 19, flower child. Yes. And so I left with a headband on my head, flower in it, <laughs> for Europe. Lovely. So I roamed around Europe and then... In order to get a stay permit, I joined Hamburg University and did my PhD in politics. And my dad, who was Indian-American, uh, told me to come to the U.S. Okay. instead. So in 72, I migrated to the U.S. from Hamburg. Pamela was a New Jersey girl, learning the love of nature from her mother, who was part Native American. Uh, I was born in a small town called Red Bank, New Jersey, on the east coast of the USA. Uh, from a large family, uh, five kids, I was a kid that was always in the woods. I had to be in nature. I've never been a, a city person. And how and where did you meet your partner in crime, Anil? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Uh, my partner in crime, I met in my hometown. He had an Indian food restaurant that he and his partner had established. Yeah, yeah. And my younger sister worked for him as a waitress. Mm -hmm. I went to get the car keys from her to go to my summer job. And that's when I first saw him and met him. And uh, then he found out where I was working, came down and asked me out. We started our married life together in Denver, Colorado. Okay. I could not move back to the East Coast after experiencing the Rocky Mountains in the forest, in the wildlife. The Rocky so, Mountain High. <laughs> yeah, the Rocky Mountain High, well put. Um, so he sold his restaurant and followed me. I decided love before money. And despite all the advice I was getting that I was stupid after having made a success here, why am I giving up all the money I'm making and moving yeah. to Colorado? 
and this was a rare combination I had found and which had a heart to heart connection which to me surpassed any money or, or commerce I could be involved in. Even though we didn't own land or anything back then, every single weekend we would take off and go up into some wooded area and I was taught as a child by my mother that whenever you go into nature you should give some kind of offering. Okay. And so we would bring some seeds or something for the birds and then we would just sit in nature. With their appreciation of natural beauty, the couple fell in love with Hawaii and bought land there for a forest sanctuary. But family matters brought them to India. The reason we returned to India originally was because my father-in-law fell ill. About six months after we arrived, he passed away. So it wasn't a question in our minds we're going to return to India for good at that point in time. We hadn't gone with the idea we're leaving permanently, but it ended up evolving yes. into that, developing into that. When Dad died, when Anil's father passed away, we took the Asti up to Haridwar for immersion in the Ganges. And it was there that we fell in love with the Himalayas. And that's when the transition started of moving from America completely to India. The dream of a forest sanctuary still continued. But land sealing rules in what was then Uttar Pradesh restricted them to the ownership of only 12 acres which was just not big enough for their dreams. So they came southwards. When I researched, I found that the Western Ghats mm. are the source of all your streams and rivers. Like this beautiful stream Like here. this stream for all South India and Maharashtra. And Kurg was the heart of the Western Ghats. When you have a hundred foot tree, you have a hundred foot root. When you have a thick forest, the roots combine underground and form ponds and lakes from the rains. Underneath? Underneath. The leaves suck up this water like you do a straw up to the branches in a scientific process called transpiration. Moisture forms, rises as water vapor, mm. rain clouds form, you get rain. And so what I was looking for was now perennial water. So when I came in checked his land and saw this, I flipped out. I immediately called her. I said, babe, we have found our peace. Little did I realize how complicated purchasing land in Kurg is. It was just the first step. It oh, God. <laughs> and all the white hair is due to all that. And then slowly over 15 years, got this pocket next to it, that pocket next to it. And they have the most peculiar laws on earth. City dwellers get used to the absence of real darkness. There's always some sort of light. In the forest, though, on a moonless night, it is totally pitch black. It isn't silent, though. There's a constant sympathy that goes on. Don't adjust your sets. This is what I could see and hear from the door of my room on a moonless night.